they have uh, you see that they have been protonated and they are separated into a analyzer and they are detected okay so uh, this is how typically mass spec looks on x axis you will see the m by z whereas on y axis they relate to our abundance uh, this is i think many of you again might have seen this slide okay so mass spec essentially consists of a sample inlet and there is an ion source so once the ionization occurs the ions needs to be transferred to a mass analyzer mass analyzer is a region uh, is a it's a component of mass spec where the ions are transferred uh, separated according to their mass to charge ratio and then there is a detector which detects these ions and recorder gives in the form of uh, mass spec so uh, again there are different kinds of ion source mass analyzers detectors i'll quickly run through those slides so in the inlet system uh, the inlet inlet could be anything like it could be your hplc or a nano lc or a capillary lc whereas in case of multi it's a multi target plate you can also use a syringe pump uh, in in case of electrospray ion so these are again different kinds of ion sources or ionization methods so we have electron ionization chemical ionization field ionization field desorption and so on but in in the case of biological mass spectrometry uh, these are the two uh, ionizations especially the electrospray ionization and maldi ionization are most widely used because they are soft ionization when i say soft ionization it means when you analyze any high molecular um, molecule um, uh, high molecule uh, mass peptides or proteins they remain intact they do not get disintegrated or fragmented by these methods by electrospray or maldi ionization therefore they are called soft ionization and they have become uh, quite popular uh, in the biological mass spectrometry and proteomics so then we have different kinds of analyzers magnetic sector time of flight scorpio pole ion trap orbit traps and so on i'll not go into the details uh, the hardware aspects or the electronic aspects so but uh, you should know that uh, mass analyzer is a component of mass spec where the ions will be separated according to their mass to charge ratio and there are high resolution uh, analyzers mass analyzers and there are also low resolution mass analyzers so quadrupole and ion trap are considered as low resolving mass analyzers for as time of flight ion cyclotron orbit trap magnetic detectors they are all high resolution mass uh, mass analyzers and then there are mass detectors so here electron multiplier faraday cap they detects these ions and then you will get the mass so again we have different kinds of mass specs like triple quadrupole quad uh, quad huge top quadrupole time of flight quadrupole uh, orbit trap that's q exacto top top and so on so these mass specs are named depending upon the configuration when when i say triple quadrupole there are three quadrupoles in the mass spec and similarly when i say q top that means there is a quadrupole and there is a time of flight when i say top top there are two analyzers top and top likewise uh, so the mass specs are named depending upon their configuration of uh, what they contain so let me directly go into uh, the main application of mass spec that is peptide mass fingerprinting or it's also called peptide mapping uh, this is uh, uh, like when the you know, when the protein identification by mass spec started so this is the initial people used to identify the proteo uh, proteins mainly by this method uh, maybe about 20 years ago so here what is done is the protein of interest is hydrolyzed into smaller peptides okay so the hydrolysis occurs by using proteases such as trypsin or thymotrypsin or you can use other proteases so the peptide masses are formed and these masses are analyzed on a mass spec okay 
So uh, in the early 1990s, uh, this peptide mask fingerprinting uh, has been uh, was invented. Okay. So at that time, uh, uh, the genome sequencing was also going on, uh, especially the all the model organisms and human genome sequencing uh, has uh, uh, sequencing was completed in the 19 early 90s. Okay. As well as there was a development in the uh, computational approaches, so it was possible to uh, calculate the um, uh, calculate as well as uh, as well as compute the uh, theoretically the different uh, uh, different masses of the peptides as well as in, do in silico translation of the genome and all this uh, was possible. So, so in peptide mass fingerprinting, what is essentially done, done is the peptides uh, formed by proteolytic uh, digestion are analyzed by mass spec. And these peptide masses are now compared to the theoretically generated peptide masses. Okay. So depending on the number of peptides matched, so you will be identifying, you will, you will get a list of proteins. So I, I think this slide will uh, clarify you better. So here again, the protein is digested into peptides and they were analyzed on mass spec. Okay. So these are the masses and now these are compared to the theoretical library. Okay. So depending upon the number of peptide match, so you will get a report. So in this case, uh, the, the first uh, mass spectrum shows there are seven peptides are matched into the protein X. So the red line indicates the peptide masses that are matching with the protein X. Whereas protein Y, there are two peptides that match, show match with the protein Y. And there's only one peptide that matches with the protein Z. Okay. So likewise, you will get a list of proteins. Um, this is the report, uh, hits, different hits, protein X, Y, Z. So you will also get the score. Uh, depending upon the number of peptides matched. For example, protein X shows maximum number of peptide matches. So therefore the score is thousand. So it's not only the number of peptide matches, it's also with what accuracy and how many peptides are matching, what is the sequence coverage, uh, whether they are there miscleavages or not, all these uh, parameters are considered uh, to uh, get a uh, score. So the proteins used in peptide mass fingerprinting are uh, normally um, the most widely used is trypsin and other proteases such as chymotrypsin, lysine, as ASPN, endopeptide, endopeptide, and this is chemically uh, chemical hydrolysis cyanogen bromide. So the trypsin cleaves at the C terminals of lysine and arginine, arginine. Whereas chymotrypsin cleaves at the aromatic amino acids, lysine cleaves at C terminal uh, or terminals of lysine, ASP and endopeptidase cleaves at glutamic acid. So this is again, uh, and this is another, this is a protein. Okay. You see that when you use trypsin, it can cleave at various lysines and arginines, okay, which are uh, highlighted in uh, orange color. Okay. As a result, you will get different masses. Okay. So these masses, I will see one example. Uh, this was done quite long back. We had at the time very uh, old. Now it's absolute, the, uh, this mass spec, multi-top uh, Voyager model. So here, the interleukin-2 was hydrolyzed by trypsin, and the peptides formed were analyzed on multi-top. So these peptide masses are now exported to an Excel sheet like this. And then uh, this was used as a query to search a protein. Okay. So mascot uh, is one of the widely used search engines. Uh, so you submit this peptide masses as a query. And now you need to give uh, all this information, your name, email ID, and the taxonomy from which source you have isolated the protein and the enzyme, and then, and then uh, during digestion of a protein, one of the, 
well, one of the process we do is we denature the protein by uh, reduction and alkylation. Okay. So as a result, the cysteines are modified with carbamide methylation. Okay. And as well as uh, the methionines are oxidized, which is a variable way, uh, uh, modification. And that time, uh, the mass accuracy uh, about 100 ppm moles we used to consider. But now the new generation mass specs, uh, such as Orbitra or QTOP, they give mass accuracy less than uh, 5 ppm. Okay. So now you submit this as a query and do a search. And now you will get the results since this protein was interleukin 2. So you get the interleukin 2. And it also shows how many number of peptides match. So, so there are seven peptides which are matching here. And the sequence coverage is 62 or 64%. As a result, this was the first hit we posted. Okay. So uh, this is how the peptide mass fingerprinting works. Uh, but sometimes peptide mass fingerprinting doesn't work in conditions like this. Okay. So here, let's. these are actually two uh, my students, Rima and Mira. So if you look at this word, Rima and Mira are anagrams. Okay. So they can have a uh, like now if you consider this Rima and Mira as a peptides, so they will have a same molecular weight, okay. Now, uh, now if you, in your peptide mass fingerprinting, if you do not identify enough peptides and you end up in identifying only one peptide, then you will not be able to identify confidently, okay, because uh, Rima and Mira, uh, they will have a similar mo molecular weight, okay. So therefore, it becomes very important to if you want to identify confidently, if, uh, you need to identify more number of peptides. Otherwise, uh, if only few peptides are identified, then it's important to do uh, MSMS or tandem mass spectrometry. Okay. So tandem mass spectrometry is the ability to isolate different molecular ions in the analyzer, generate fragment ions from the selected parent ion, uh, this parent ion is also called precursor ion, and then fragment in a collision in this dissociation chamber, and the fragment ions formed, they are either called product ions or daughter ions. So they will be used to deduce the structure. Okay, so they will be separated uh, tandem in space and tandem in time. So the fragment ions formed are used for the structural determination of the uh, peptide or a structural determination or sequence determination of the peptide. So let's see this, uh, okay, before I go to that uh, cartoon. So I would like to uh, brief you on this. So the, whenever you do a peptide fragmentation uh, using collusion induced dissociation, the fra fragmentation occurs at the peptide bond between C and N, okay, mostly, okay. So from the carboxy, from the amino terminus, uh, the, these ions are called B ions. And from the carboxy terminus, they are called uh, Y ions. The first B ion, uh, the, the fragment formed, the first fragment formed from the amino terminus is called B1 ion. The second fragment, okay, that is formed uh, from the amino terminus is called B2 ion and so on. Whereas from the carboxy terminus, the first fragment ion is called Y1, and the second fragment ion is called Y2, third, Y3, and so on, okay. So you need to remember that whenever you do a peptide fragmentation by CID, the fragmentation occurs at peptide bond. As a result, B and Y ions are formed. Okay, let's look at this cartoon. So here there's the protein so it has uh, both lysines and arginines. If you use now trypsin, so it can cleave at all these possible sites, which are marked in red color, lysine, lysine, okay, or arginine, okay. So here, what he, this person is doing is, he's selecting this particular peptide, AEPTR, and this selected peptide is fragmented in a collusion chamber by applying uh, collusion energy. So now AEPTIR gets fragmented into B and Y ions, okay, into fragment ions. So now uh, here, what is done is you see here. So these are the fragment ions formed. Now we'll try to 
assign the uh, annotate this uh, msms spectrum the first peak is uh, the mass of the first peak is 72 you know uh, 72 corresponds to aligning 71 plus protonation 72 so you can assign this as aligning and now you go to the next peak which is 201 you subtract 72 the first amino acid from 201 the difference uh, gives the mass of uh, sec the mass of the next amino acid so 201.1 minus 72 is 129 so glutamic acid can you see this okay yeah so glutamic uh, acid is 129 okay now go to the next uh, peak which is 298 so you subtract 201 from 298.1 so now you, the difference is 98 so the 98 corresponds to proline 97 plus one protonation proline so likewise you can manually do a de novo sequencing of a factor okay so however now uh, we have uh, we have softwares which can do all this in an automated way. So in about two hours of acquisition by LCMS MS, so you will get as many as three to 4,000 uh, protein identified. Uh, in, uh, so that's the throughput of uh, mass spec. So, uh, so you need not have to do manually, like you do a data dependent acquisition or data independent acquisition there so this is the workflow like you have to uh, i will not go into these details like you have to uh, this again is after acquisition you will need to uh, do the search so now you will get a uh, uh, like this is the proteome discover software so you will get a list of protein identity ident uh, protein ids as well as the peptide spectral matches and the a peptide sequence details you will get also get msms of each peptide and uh, as, as well as the precursor masses. so so in uh, as i said in a, for two hours of uh, lcms acquisition you can identify about three to five thousand in some cases five you can even identify five thousand proteins uh, with all uh, details okay so, uh, then you can also characterize uh, post translation modifications. So it's very important. Uh, for many post, -tran post translation mo modifications determine the protein function. For example, uh, phosphorylation is uh, very important PTM, which uh, which is involved in many of the signal transduction pathways, and glycosylation is important to um, for the translocation of proteins, and ubiquitination is uh, required if a protein has to undergo degradation. So even in the when you do um, even in the biopharma, uh, it's very important to maintain the uh, intake, maintain the homogeneity as well as if if a particular uh, post translation modification such as glycosylation, if it is there, you need to maintain that uh, PTM in all the batches when you produce such uh, uh, bio biotherapeutics or. Uh, therapeutic maps okay so therefore let's try to understand how we characterize the ptms okay so as i said there are again uh, different uh, ptms like glycosylation glycation ubiquitation escalation and so on so yeah our lab uh, okay before that so i'll show you how it is done by msms so this is a peptide unmodified peptide Whereas the second peptide is a modified peptide, the fourth residue carries the PTM. So this is at the MS level. So unmodified and the modified shows an increase in mass uh, corresponding to the PTM. But when you do MSMS, so you will get the uh, fragment ions of both unmodified and modified peptide. Here you see that since the fourth residue uh, carries the PTM, okay so so the first three fragments are same masses okay whereas from fourth residue onwards 
the fragment ion masses have shifted towards right side, uh, they show an increase in mass corresponding to the PTM. So, uh, so the mass spec can also be used to characterize the PTM as well as locate where, where exactly which residue is uh, modified. Yes, okay. So I'll show you a couple of examples. Uh, so our, as I said, like we have been working on glycation. This is also one of the uh, one of the modification that occurs uh, during uh, during uh, production of biotherapeutics as well as during storage. So let's try to understand how we characterize the glycations. Okay. So glycation is predominantly it. it, it occurs in diabetic condition. However, I'm not going to touch upon those things, but I want to show you how we characterize the glycation modification. So what we did is we modified the protein with, uh, here in this case, the protein used was albumin. We modified the albumin with glucose or glycolic acid or methyl glycol, and they formed a different modified albumin, like for example, glucose formed, uh, Glucose uh, treatment of glucose to albumin led to amaldry modified albumin. Glycolic acid treatment led to carboxymethylysin modified albumin, whereas methylglycol treatment resulted in carboxymethylysin modified. So these uh, differently modified albumin now uh, so was now these uh, uh, modified albumin were subjected to trypsic digestion, and then they were analyzed on high resolution accurate mass spec that is quadruple or trap. And uh, the diagnostic uh, uh, signature ion library was generated for this. So uh, I'll show you how we can characterize these PTMs. So uh, validation of glycation modification. Okay, there should be accurate mass shift in precursor ion corresponding to modification. Here, the the top uh, mass spectrum. Uh, is an unmodified peptide that is AQTAL, whereas the bottom one is uh, a modified one. And this is a carboxymethyl glycine modified peptide. Okay, so this shows an increase in mass by 58 daltons, and the accuracy was less than one ppm. Okay. Next, what we did is we fragmented this peptide. Okay. Uh, as I said earlier, the fragmentation of peptide leads to formation of B and Y ions from the amino terminus B ions and the for, from the carboxy terminus Y ions. Uh, let's look at this cartoon again. Well, it, like here, KQTL is uh, VELK is a peptide. So now, if you fragment this peptide by CID, so you will get B and Y ions. Okay, this is an unmodified peptide. So the B1 will be K, B2 will be KQ, B3 will be KQT, B4 will be KQTA and so on. Whereas Y ions will be from carboxy terminus, Y1 will be K, Y2 will be VK, Y3 will be LVK, Y4 will be ELVK and so on. Okay. Now, uh, let's consider this lysine is modified by carboxy ethyl lysine. So it shows an increase in mass by 72 daltons. So now if a modified peptide is fragmented, so here the first lysine is modified. As a result, your B1 will be, will show an increase in mass by 72. B1 is lysine, it shows an increase in mass by 72. Since the B2 will carry a B1 ion, so B2 is a KQ, right? So in this case, since the first amino acid is modified, so the B2 shows an increase in mass of 72. So likewise, all the B ions now they show an increase in mass by 72. Whereas the Y ions do not retain this lysine, the last lysine. So therefore, the Y ions do not carry modification as a result, they don't show any increase in mass. So therefore, the, when, while annotating, you need to remember if the lysine is, if the PTM is at the uh, amino terminus, then the Y ions will 
between unmodified and modified will remain same, whereas B will show an increasing mass. So let's look at that. How to identify glycation modification? If I can't see this slide. Okay. So here you see this is the same peptide KQTAL. Uh, this is unmodified, whereas this is a modified. So as I said, like this, why ions remain common between unmodified and modified? You see here, these are the Y ions. Okay, they are the molecular masses are similar between unmodified and modified. Okay, whereas B ions show an increase in mass corresponding to modification. So all the B ions show now an increase in mass by plus 72 times. Okay. The first one is in the in case of unmodified, the lysine is 128 plus one. Whereas in case of modified, the lysine shows an increase in mass by 72 times, 128 plus 72 plus one. So here uh, the the first uh, fragment on is 201. Okay. So likewise, all the B ions now show an increase in mass uh, by some ions. And the other criteria that we considered was MSMS spectra should have three consecutive B or Y ions while retaining the modification. Now, if you look at these peptides, so uh, these B ions, uh, like there are consecutive B ions, B1, B2, B3, similarly Y1, Y2, Y3. So uh, as well as they retain the modification. So likewise, we created this mass spectral library for uh, different glycated peptides. So I'll not get into that part. Okay. So, uh, so I wanted to emphasize uh, you that with the mass spec, it's possible to, to do a sequencing of peptide as well as do a peptide mapping as well as characterize the different PTMs. Okay. Now, this is again, I will not go. Now we'll try to uh, see how we extended this approach to characterize therapeutic monoclonal antibodies. So our our goal was to develop mass spectral library for characterization of recombinant uh, therapeutic monoclonal antibodies. Uh, you all know that MAPs are powerful therapeutics in oncology, autoimmunity, inflammation, infectious diseases, and metabolic disorders. Currently, about 40 FDA-approved therapeutic maps are there, which accounts to about 18.5 billion US dollars. About 70 maps will be in the market by 2020. Last year was a bad year because of COVID, and about 300 maps are in the process of development. Uh, biosimilar maps are also capturing the market locally as well as in there. So what are the challenges in map production? Maintenance of homogeneity in the production of therapeutic maps is challenging. Map structure and folding is determined by amino acid sequence and its post-translation modification, such as glycosylation, phosphor phosphorylation, glycation, deviation, etc. A high degree of structural heterogeneity exists at the level of PTMs. Therefore, extensive analytical characterization is required. And mass spec is an important tool in map characterization. You see here, uh, this, uh, maps uh, structure, the IgG map is basically IgG. It has uh, two heavy chains and two light chains. The molecular weight of map is about approximately 148 kilodalton. It has two subunits, heavy chain and light chain. Uh, one, but the, uh, one of the uh, uh, common features is the constant region is same for most of uh, for all the maps. And the PTMs, the deamidation, oxidation, glycation. So most of these PTMs occurs during the production of maps. So mass spec is a key tool uh, in the uh, recombinant map analysis. It relies on search algorithms and reference ion libraries or databases for identification and characterization is not available. So therefore, we wanted to establish uh, the mass spectral library for 
a few of the commercially available maps. So uh, the objectives of our study was to develop comprehensive mass spectral library for identification and characterization of recombinant maps by using combination of top-down, middle-down, bottom-up approaches, characterization of PTMs such as deamination, oxidation, glycosylation, and glycan analysis, and to develop user-friendly searchable database uh, of, uh, database of spectral library for identification and characterization. So the workflow of involved uh, for characterization, we took two commercially available uh, maps, Trastuzumab and it's uh, biosimilar, that's CANMAP and Hasaptin is the innovator, and CANMAP is its biosimilar. Similarly for Rituximab, Anfira and Ristova. So we did all this uh, top down, middle down and bottom up. However, today I'm mainly focusing on the bottom up approaches. So uh, we digested with all these enzymes and, and, and uh, analyzed by high resolution and great mass effect that's uh, using all the track. So one of the challenges is uh, sequence coverage with trypsin is very low, okay. So here uh, you, you see these are some of the large, uh, if you look, this is a trastuzumab, heavy chain and light chain, you, you see here, it's so big peptide, uh, sometimes it doesn't fly, okay, in the basket. Okay. There are no licensed analgesics. As a result, uh, the total sequence coverage we get with trypsin is uh, 49 and 60 percent. For heavy chain, it's 49, and for light chain, it's 60 percent. So these are the challenges in characterization, okay. There are large peptides as well as the short peptides which we miss during analysis. And this is again a very huge peptide. And there are also late eluting peptides. Okay. And there are peptides with the N glycosylation site. So if you use only one enzyme, you will not be able to comprehensively uh, map. Uh, map these maps. Okay. So, uh, therefore, we use parallel enzymatic digestion approach. So, we used uh, different proteases like trypsin, glucine, chymotrypsin, hermolysin. So, you, you know that trypsin gives at C terminus of lysine and alginine, glucine at C terminus of uh, uh, aspartic acid and glutamic acid, chymotrypsin at aromatic amino acids and methanine and thermolysin at n terminus of leucine, phenylalanine, valine, isoleucine, and methionine, alanine and methionine. Okay, so, so when we used uh, multiple enzymes, we got a very good coverage. For heavy chain, we got 86.41, for light chain, 97.1. So this is a sequence coverage with trypsin, chymotrypsin, glucine. So trypsin gave 49 and 60, trypsin plus chymotrypsin, 63 and 84, trypsin, chymotrypsin, glucine, 76 and 93, whereas including uh, of thermolysin improved to 86 and 96. So these, uh, these are done parallelly. They are not, all the enzymes are not used together, okay? So, uh, so, you need to use, if you want to map um, uh, map conferentially, so you need to use multiple proteases to get a uh, good sequence coverage. Okay. So yeah, this is again uh, a trastuzumab and it's biosimilar. Uh, okay. So this, uh, these are the sequence coverages of trastuzumab and it's biosimilar, rituximab and it's uh, biosimilar. So these are the sequence coverage and number of peptides. So, so uh, with with uh, with multiple proteases, we could increase the number of peptide identification as well as the sequence coverage. That's what I would like to highlight on this slide. And then we look also we looked into the post-translation modifications. One of the examples I'm presenting here is 
deamidation. So whenever a uh, protein or a peptide undergoes deamidation, there is an increase in mass by 0.98 daltons. So this occurs during manufacturing and storage of mats and at the high pH stress condition. Deamination in complementary determining regions can affect antigen binding property, which can lead to substantial loss of potential. Okay. So this is an unmodified, uh, so this is a modified uh, peptide of a modified peptide, and this is an unmodified peptide. So here the encircle shows this, um, uh, this, uh, this is a glutamine, sorry. Uh, yeah, so uh, as patching. So uh, here you see uh, there's an eight and, uh, 861, and this, this is an 860. There is an increase in mass by one delta. Okay. So uh, we compared uh, uh, the deumidation sites identical to those uh, reported previously. So, uh, like uh, this is a biosimilar innovator, like these are the reported sites. Aspargine and glutamine. Okay. Uh, similarly, uh, we ha also have identified additional deamination sites in both trastuzumab as well as rituximab. Okay. These are uh, newly identified in our study, which were not previously reported. Okay. And this is another example of oxidation. So this shows a mass increase about 16 daltons. Okay. Acus due to prolonged storage causes decrease, uh, uh, causes of the oxidation or decreased thermal stability, increased aggregation, oxidation in CDR can cause decrease in antigen binding property and decreases potency. So here you see that uh, this particular fragment shows an increase in mass by 16 daltons corresponding to oxidation. So likewise, we have identified oxidation sites and compared to the previous study, as well as identified newly new oxidation sites in both trastuzumab and rituximab, biosimilar as well as in So that's what I wanted to tell in this presentation. I this is our group. I thank all my collaborators and my students. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, sir. We have a couple of questions. I'll read it out to you. Yes, please. Yeah. So the first one is, could this peptide digestion fingerprinting be done on any MS? Or are there any special MS uh, you need to which deal with this application? You need to have a high resolution accurate mass spec, either TOF or Orbitrap are the commonly used. So if you you cannot identify or sequence the protein on low resolution mass spec such as uh, triple, uh, such as quadruple or ion trap. Okay, sir. The next question is, what strategy should one follow in order to characterize the mass of a 60 kilodalton protein, which is difficult to ionize, and should one do the peptide fragment fragmentation fingerprinting? So 60 kilodalton can also can be analyzed uh, on ESI. Okay, you will get. However, you'll get multiply charged uh, ions. Okay, you need to deconvolute, and you will get an intact mass of 60 kD. Uh, but uh, you, but that will not uh, uh, tell you if there are any PTMs and where exactly. So in order to identify PTMs and get a complete sequence coverage, I think the bottom of approach is a better strategy. So the next question is, can we see the spectrum change of a distorted structure marginally? If yes, at what level and which mass spec and separation technique would be able to separate these marginally changes in the structure of protein from the native protein in post-degradation study? 
can you repeat the question like yes yes can we see the spectrum change of the distorted structures marginally if yes at what level and which mass spec and separation technique would be able to separate these marginal changes in the structure of protein from native in post degradation studies so you can also see the questions in the chat box okay uh, so uh, one of the approaches to study the structural changes is the ion mobility okay there can be ion mobility shift uh, if the protein is uh, denatured or folded differently okay so ion mobility mass spec is so one of the approaches used to study the structure but again uh, the problem is if the molecular weight of protein is uh, higher it's difficult to uh, get ionization so if, if the protein has small molecular weight protein then you can use ion mobility and esi ms uh, to study the structures next question is at ms2 level will will everything be broken and uh, will we get the b and the y ion so it depends upon collusion energy if, if the collusion energy is higher so the peptide uh, will be completely fragmented into b and y ions but if you use a collusion energy let's say 15 to 20 okay then uh, you will get partial like you will get the precursor as well as some of the fragment ions the next one is if there is mixed population of modified and unmodified peptide population can we still identify both and if yes can we quantify these relatively yes it's possible to uh, identify and quantify but for quantification there are other mass specs like uh, triple quadruple are used uh, which uh, which triple quadruple is considered as a gold standard for absolute quantification Okay. And uh, and uh, the, you said uh, whether it's possible to identify when they are together. See, uh, see when we are doing a uh, data dependent uh, acquisition. So the modified and unmodified have different masses. Okay, so therefore you will not get um, uh, you will not get a combined mass spectrum of both unmodified and modified. they will be eluted at different time points as a result you will get different mass spectrums okay how to inactivate the activity of first enzyme during parallel digestion no we have not uh, done together they are done separately like trypsin uh, digestion was done separately and all the uh, protease digestion was done separately and then we got the sequence correction so it's not a we have not added a cocktail of proteases they are done separately how can we assure that one enzyme is not cleaving or digesting the other enzyme other than the peptide or map use how can you uh, this come so i think it, it's related to the parallel uh, proteases that Uh, related to the previous question it's like how can we assure that one enzyme is not cleaving or digesting the other enzyme other than the peptide or the map used this is in case if you are using the I, parallel I, digestion i think i would like to clarify we have not used the cocktail they are uh, done separately okay so the question doesn't come like uh, how uh, one will not digest the other proteins Okay. Okay, sir. What are the factors responsible for homogeneity of monoclonal antibody? So the factors is again, uh, it's a uh, maps uh, are quite high, large molecular weight proteins, and it's important uh, to maintain batch to batch homogeneity. There are various st steps like uh, it's in the protein synthesis. Uh, like it, you can it can go wrong in protein synthesis and once the protein is produced see all this occurs in the cell so it's a you need to maintain the everything homogeneously like you all the soft 
you, any change in temperature or pH or in, uh, in the media can result uh, result in uh, changes in the protein uh, like PTNs or mutations are possible if uh, if there is a change in uh, pH or temperature of the media. Like it's a quite complex process, so it's important to uh, maintain the homo homogeneity during the production. The next one is, do we need a special setup for peptide fingerprinting or it could be done on a setup like Microtop from Drupal? Microtop can be used. A top or Orbitrap can be used for peptide mapping. So there's one question, during double digestion, then how did the sequence coverage increase during single digestion? So again, this is related. I think the participants are, uh, I think uh, I need to clarify that we have not done double digestion means it's not, we have not added two enzymes at a time. It was done separately. And then the sequence coverage was analyzed. And the last question is, how can we cut the successive amino acids of a polypeptide? Success, it's, see, it have, when you add a protease, so all forms of fragment ions are formed, okay? And they are analyzed. So it's not that it clears one by one. Like There will be a, a mixture of fragment ions. So one, it's not that sequentially it gets. So when a peptide, when you add trypsin to a peptide, so it, uh, so, 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 sorry, this is related to mass spec uh, fragmentation, right? Hello? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so, sorry, I'm, so when you do a fragmentation by CID, okay, so the fragment, all sorts of fragment ions are, are formed, like both B and Y ions. You, do, you don't have control, like it's not sequentially cleaved in the sense you will have all sorts of fragment ions. So these fragment ions, when you analyze, so we are analyzing in a sequential way. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So I think there are no more questions in the chat box. Okay. So can you please go to the first slide of your presentation? We will just take a snapshot. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the clear presentation. Thank you. Dr. Ratnish. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Mahesh, for uh, giving this wonderful presentation. Uh, I think uh, we'll take uh, this opportunity to say thank you on behalf of Biosimilar Workshop. And uh, we'll look forward for more interaction. Um, I think to the participant, uh, you can also approach Dr. Kulkarni directly from National Chemical Laboratory website or the email ID, which he has already shared, I guess, in the presentation. And uh, you can also separately approach us uh, in case you wish to be connected for further interaction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahesh. Thank you very much. I'll give you the opportunity to present your yeah. work here. Yeah. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.